welcome to Port Credit Secondary School's 75th anniversary. I'm Tina May. In the next hour, we'll capture a glorious glimpse of how it felt to attend this historic school with interviews of people who return one weekend in May to their alma mater. Walk the halls of memories with us as we rekindle past and present moments of glory, learning, and above all, friendships. If you went to credit, you may recognize the following stories and snapshots. If you didn't, well, you're about to take a trip through time. We'll be hearing seven voices reminisce about their 75 years at Peel's oldest high school. And as you'll see, the time they spent here touched and changed their lives forever. It all began in the early 1900s. High school was only available in Toronto, so teens living in Port Credit went to schools like Parkdale Collegiate. But after World War I, residents agreed a local school was needed. So in 1919, the Port Credit Continuation School was born. It mixed elementary and secondary students, and it was led by a man named Henry Dupe, who would be a teacher and principal here for over 30 years. Ruby Filardo remembers those early days very well. She was one of Port Credit's first students. I came to Port Credit in 1912, 1912 to 13, from England. I've lived in Port Credit ever since. Port Credit was a small town at that time. It wasn't. Um, as grown as it is today. And um, it was a lovely, friendly place. Everybody knew everybody. It was all friends. And uh, we were all sort of, the class was always like, we were all seemed to be brought up together because we went along together all the time. The children here in, came from Streetsville, Cooksville, Dixie, Lauren Park, Clarkson. It was an area school. As you might imagine, high school in the 20s was quite different than it is today. There were few extracurricular activities, and the focus was strictly on the three R's, which, according to Ruby, meant rules, regulations, and respect. We had to do what we were told to do. We had to do our homework and try their exams, just the same as they do today. But we're, I think, morally, more or less, I don't know so long time since I was at school, but we, they were strict and we had to abide by the rules of the school. If we didn't, we got the strap. <laughs> Times certainly did change in more ways than one. By 1929, this 11-room school was bursting at the seams. The student population had grown from just 22 to over 200. So on the eve of the Great Depression, a new school was built up the street on Forest Avenue. This building was twice the size of the original, and it had a new name, Port Credit High, the first official high school in what was then Peel County. The school in those days was not only the place of education, but it was the center of the community. It was a community center. I came to Port Credit High School as a young teacher in 1933. Uh, and at that time, Port Credit was considered a rural area. The area was uh, comprised of uh, orchards, market gardens, and some farms. Uh, at that time, the school was comprised of uh, 12 teachers. We had about 330 students. But the students were really very uh, diligent and very anxious to do well because times were hard. And if they were going to get a job, they knew that they would have to have an education. Well, I had moved from a city. And when we first came here, it was all kind of pretty well farm area and farm country. And I think the camaraderie of all the people within the area, because all the farmers knew all the farmers and all the farmers' children came here at the same time we did. And I... There were the glee clubs and double trio, which I was in. And we used to go to the uh, music festivals, the Kiwanis music festivals, uh, up in Brampton or in Port Credit or where the, wherever they might be. There were football games, basketball games, and as many of the students who could go did go. There was a lot of um, uh, s spirit within the school. 
Um, one of the things I remembered uh, was one of our local boys, Doug Burgess, was in the Air Force, and he came right over the playing field, very, very low one day. Uh, I don't know for whose benefit. It might have been for Mr. Wood's benefit. I don't know, but uh, I, I believe he was reported for low flying. Uh, that was very exciting to the whole school. But Doug was one of the um, students who was killed. It was very, very sad. Spring 1995 marked the 50th anniversary of VE Day, the end of the Second World War in Europe. A fitting time to remember the almost 400 Port Credit teachers, students and alumni who fought for their country. Most were flight officers in the Air Force, and 26 were killed in the line of duty. For the kids who went to Port Credit back then, especially the boys, they knew full well what awaited them after graduation. Their carefree high school days were over. They knew they'd soon be facing the harsh realities of war. Out of my class, there's some... I'm just trying to recollect, but I, I would think there was six of the guys who were killed in the Air Force. And um, most, there weren't too many, well, there were a few in the Navy, but not too many in the Army who was of our troop who all seemed to be into the, into the Air Force. Port credit, I guess, was the time that in my life where I had to make, it, it matured me to the point that I had to make, make certain decisions in life. And uh, of course, with the war coming along, that uh, certainly assisted in that point. During the, uh, at the time of the war, many of our students were in the services, were in the armed services. Many of them were killed and never came back. So the school definitely has contributed to the uh, welfare and the well-being of the country. Other than sporadic news from the front lines and gas rationing, life at Port Credit during the war was relatively normal. Students were active in many clubs and activities. And the boys, too young to go to war, engaged in other battles. Only these ones were fought and won on the football field. The first time they ever had a senior Western group champions were under Frank Monroe in 42, 43, and 44. Yes, I was uh, uh, a football coach before I came here, you see, as well, you know. Uh, from 1941, when I came, the, the fellows found out within two weeks that I was some sort of, they thought, an expert on six-man football, which had come up from the States, you see. And so they asked me if they could, uh, they could have a team. They, um, they star, uh, in 1942, I guess, with a star, uh, took a, uh, a picture of me under the stands at, at uh, Crank Stadium, and they called me the modern Gamaliel because I was, he thought I was, I was giving the, um, the, you know, the final hurrahs to get out there and win. We beat Runnymede, it was a big school, and in 1944, they, uh, before the game, we, went, we, we had a way of going down out the field and we, we lateraled the ball back and forth, back and forth down the field and then went down. And so the, the, the running meat fa fans were there and they all started to boo and they said, yeah, here come the farmers. You see from here, the farmers. So to make a long story uh, short, uh, when they came back in before the game, I said uh, to them, I said, did you hear the, the, the boos from from Brunny May then? I said, did you hear what they said? And so Lauren Smith, who was one of my star players, he said, yeah, and he called us the farmers. He said, guys, let's go and shove it down their throats, and we did. <laughs> we beat them. In those days, Mr. Monroe wasn't just a coach at credit, he was also a referee of sorts. At school dances or in the halls, he often ran interference between male and female students. We had that uh, ruling that the boys were stood on one side and the gallery, the gallery around the 
the uh, the games that are, that are being taking place down below, either volleyball or m most of them are basketball. And then the girls were around in the other half, you see. Well, then the, the sweethearts, they would beat the system by coming right up there and they'd hold hands and squeeze them. And I, started, I, I, I didn't bother. I let them go ahead and do it with Dale. <laughs> I came from Toronto to Port Credit in grade 9 in 1952. It, it was a wonderful time. When I, when I came, uh, Port Credit was the only high school. In the following year, Kennedy opened and, and we lost quite a few kids in that direction. It was Toronto Township at that time and it just was booming and it was a wonderful time to be here. It was like a whole new world opening as far as I was concerned. I think before I had been in Port, at, to Port Credit, I uh, was a relatively shy, quiet child. And, and the opportunity for, on teams and um, the social part of the school was a, a great time of development for me. Perhaps too much, I think, my parents thought and some of the teachers. But when I think of, of that part of my school time, what I've done with the rest of my life, it's what I learned on the teams. and. Uh, in the social aspect that, that has been very important. I've used those skills a lot. I played most team sports, basketball and volleyball. I was on the badminton team a couple of times. And I was a cheerleader for five years. And I sometimes think that's what people who meet me now think that's all I ever did. <laughs> because they immediately say, oh, Andy Crawford, I remember you as a cheerleader. The 50s at Port Credit were truly happy days. The post-war boom had ushered in many changes. By mid-decade, the number of students swelled to about 700, and the school underwent another name change, becoming Port Credit Secondary. Then, in the fall of 1956, disaster struck. At around 3 a.m. on October 18th, a fire raged through the front of the building. Classrooms, textbooks, and all school records were destroyed. The cause of the blaze was believed to be arson. Well, I think anybody that was there at the time of the fire, it's a very vivid memory. I think most of us arrived at school without knowing that the fire had occurred because it had happened during the night. Everything was black. Everything just looked like it had been painted black and, and kids were in and they were carrying things out and, and actively participating in, in the cleanup process. And, and everybody did want to be there. It, it wasn't a holiday. It was a time where we all were there doing something. The fire may have destroyed much of the building, but that famous Port Credit spirit remained intact. And ironically, a school year that started out so memorably was also destined to end that way. The year was 1957. It was just before summer vacation when something happened that's become a Port Credit legend. I guess you might say it was the one day in history where the king replaced the queen at Port Credit. Well it, was, well, it was very close to the last day of school, and it was a very warm day, and all the doors in the school were open, and all the windows were open, which was a very important part of the whole process. And generally at 310, uh, you could hear the click from the auditorium of the PA coming on, and we would stand for the playing of God Save the Queen. On this particular occasion, we were all waiting. We all stood and uh, waited for the Queen. And we could hear the record going around and around. And suddenly, you ain't nothing but a contrast between the very sedate standard queen and hearing Elvis Presley uh, burst out in nothing but a hound dog. Um, I can hear it now, just as, as it was happening right now. And I would guess that any student was there that, that was there that day remembers it very, very clearly. In the 60s and 70s, the winds of change just kept blowing. 1963 marked Port Credit's third and final move, this time to spacious new digs on Mineola Road, where the school still stands today. This modern building came with many perks. A new shop wing, more sports clubs, and a concert band were created. In the 1970s, the school library was transformed into a spacious new resource center. All of this growth reflected what was happening in Port Credit at the time. The population had boomed, local orchards were developed into housing, and by the 1980s, commerce had transformed this area forever. The 80s were pretty, pretty 
Intimidating time, especially with, uh, you know, the Reagan years and uh, of the fear about uh, nuclear war all the time. And I think that was probably reflected uh, on the students, you know, to some degree. Yeah, it was the editor, editor of the uh, school newspaper from uh, 77, or from, well, I guess it started in 80, we brought it back, and uh, Marty Anthony uh, started with me in 81, and uh, we continued on through 82. And, um, you know, I, I guess you could say we had the, uh, the pulse on the uh, school, but it was more like we, we were desperate for news, so we had to find out what was happening. Uh, I remember actually as at the time thinking that, uh, you know, spirit has hit an all-time low and that poor credit tradition is gone. But when I look back now and I think about it, uh, you know, the spirit was, it was always strong. I don't know what we were expecting it to be like. You know, I suppose back in the 30s and the 40s they had all these great uh, spirit clubs or whatever. Um, I mean, it, it still had a lot of school spirit, but probably not in the traditional sense. Poor credit to me... Is, is the epitome of tradition, and uh, actually I'm, I'm quite proud to be a, a part of that tradition. And that tradition continues today. With only five years before the millennium, Port Credit is still thriving and changing. Each year brings new technologies, new faces, and new memories. But year after year, the school remains true to its motto, Lux Numquam Desert, may the light never fail. After seven and a half decades of tradition, the light, the spirit of Port Credit, never has. My concept of a school was not a building, it was a group of people as in a school of fish, uh, so that uh, the school is constantly changing. My predecessor, Mr. Duke, made a great point of that, that the school never stays the same. The bricks and mortar and uh, steel and wood stay there, but the school itself, which is comprised of the people in it, is constantly changing new people coming in and the uh, graduates moving on. Is it a feeling of nostalgia that you have? Oh yes, of course, at my age. Everything's nostalgia. <laughs> the school is now celebrating 75 years. That's right. And you're here to celebrate it. <laughs> what are your feelings? I hate to tell you. <laughs> I hate to think I'm getting old. <laughs> I enjoyed it immensely being here. I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed the situation here. That's why I never moved. That's why I never moved. It's great to still be here. <laughs> when I think of, of, of some of the friends that I've lost in, in the meantime, and it be funny about it, I, I never expected to be around at this time. I, I could have made a lot of money if I bet on it. <laughs> Port Credit High School was to me um, a very important, happy time in my development. It, um, I think it's influenced my whole life in many ways. Um, I sometimes, I know my own children, I have five, I had a good education. They all experienced various good times in their high schools, which were all in Peel. But I don't think any of them had the opportunity that I had and, and have come away from high school with the the fine memories that I have. Well, uh, to tell you the truth, when I came through the doors today, I felt very, very teary. I still do. I went into the auditorium and it hasn't changed one bit. I find this very sad, actually. So I went up on the stage and I sang, I was there all by myself, and I sang one of the sang songs that I sang in Double Trio. And the dimensions hadn't changed. I thought it might look a lot smaller, a lot larger. But the auditorium is exactly as it was. So when I was there, I felt I was in Park Credit High. 
We're going to take a break now, but when we return, we'll take a look at the reunion which saw 2,500 students return to these hallways. Stay with us. In 1954, that terrible hurricane Hazel hit this area. It rained all day and uh, all the local rivers were swollen. Many people were, uh, had to leave their homes. Some of the homes were uh, taken out into the lake and they used the school as an emergency shelter. So we had refugees in the school for several days. They brought in extra beds and, uh, and food and uh, it became a relief center. This is Rogers TV, Mississauga. The challenges that my family had coming to Canada as immigrants and me being a first generation Canadian, and being able to see people like me on television was rare, you know, 25, 30 years ago. But because of Rogers Cable, being able to represent me and my colleagues on television, it's showing Canadians, immigrants and minorities that we have a voice. Got stuff to sell? Want stuff to buy? Swap Shop has returned to Rogers TV, Tuesdays and Fridays at 1 p.m. Watch live Tuesdays and Fridays at 1 p.m. only on Rogers TV. They say if you want a wish to come true, never tell anyone. But there is one wish that can make the difference between life and death. And this wish can only come true if you tell someone. Please let your family know you want to be an organ donor. lost, missing, or wanted persons. These are the people that are going to answer my call for help if something happens to myself, my wife, and my two little girls. There's a reason that we do it. Watch The Police Show, Sunday nights at 9.30, only on Rogers TV. This is Rogers TV, Mississauga. We've got people, uh, a girl, a classmate of mine, for example, uh, stopped me in the hallway last night and said that uh, she's been in Switzerland for 15 years and she flew over all by herself, left her family at home and uh, is here for the week. And we're hearing stories like this all day long and all last night uh, coming from all over the world. And, and that, to me, is what Poor Credit's all about. I think the spirit that we've always maintained here, of a, a good closeness, a good bonding, has just been outstanding. To kick off the weekend excitement, hundreds of former students, teachers, and principals, as well as local dignitaries, crammed the halls of Port Credit to pay tribute to long-standing years of success and tradition at the opening ceremonies. Many alumni reacquainted themselves for the first time in decades. And several corridors of the school were magically transformed into time capsules, rooms that brought back the wonder years. The year 1919 marked the beginning of a success story, a story that has touched the lives of alumni around the world. Despite the technological changes of our fast-paced society, visitors agreed they wouldn't change their high school years for any other. Having graduated from Port Credit, I feel proud to have been a part of the spirit and tradition that the school is known for. The graduates from this school have a very strong allegiance to the school. And I believe that's because they feel that the school uh, made a great impact on their life. And so today, uh, I'm sure all of those who have come back, I mean, they've come from many parts of Canada and the United States back to celebrate the 75th anniversary, which uh, certainly indicates the fact that uh, they appreciate the contribution that this secondary school, through its staff and the programs they uh, ran, uh, how it has impacted their life 
and made them success, made them a success in many fields of endeavor. The school spirit at Port Credit has always been something special. Always has been. I think the students that come to this school have always been very proud of their school and very anxious to sustain and maintain its reputation. For the alumni, coming back to relive the best years of their lives has brought back many fond memories. Wilfred Wood, who was so well known here in the school, was my mathematics teacher in the old days, and uh, he's come the closest to anybody uh, to getting me to like uh, arithmetic and math, that's, and, and that's really a compliment because it was never my best subject, but he was wonderful, and uh, he's, of course, been principal here for many years and is well loved and, and so forth and his the quality of wealth has been imparted to the school and you can see it I mean it's uh, it's been a wonderful tradition of uh, I'm sure of, uh, t of uh, teaching and of scholarship from what I can gather although I've been a long way away for a long time it was uh, during those years that we uh, uh, introduced the first uh, school magazine the log 1951 and uh, had a contest to obtain a school song. Two of our students uh, wrote that. And uh, we had our first activity banquet in those years. They were really very exciting years. During the, the time I, I was here at Port Credit, I mean, the kids were just great. And you could see there was a sense of tradition at the school, a lot of involvement and commitment on the part of the kids to the community, and uh, very, very friendly people. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. We had an excellent principal by the name of H.A. Duke. Mm -hmm. And he was a very stern man, very fair, and by all means, I think he was very well liked. But people had a great respect for him. And uh, we had, uh, one occasion, uh, our teacher became ill, and H.A. Duke became our teacher for two weeks. Now we thought, this is something, we're gonna have a pretty tough hombre here teaching us for two weeks. But when the time was up, we didn't want him to leave. He was just like a father to us, and we learned a great deal. And we're very happy to have him. In 1951, after 32 years of being principal, H.A. Dupe retired. He was replaced by Wilfred J. Wood. For both former principals and students, meeting old friends was the best part of the reunion. Mixed emotions, I say. A little sad that so many years have gone by, but very happy to see so many old friends. To me, it's wonderful to see the people come out, and and we've got people, uh, a girl, a classmate of mine, for example, uh, stopped me in the hallway last night and said that uh, she's been in Switzerland for 15 years, and she flew over all by herself, left her family at home, and uh, is here for the week. And we're hearing stories like this all day long and all last night, uh, coming from all over the world, and, and that, to me, is what Port Credit's all about. I think the spirit that we've always maintained here, of a, a good class closeness, a good bonding, has just been outstanding. It was such a wonderful school, and it was a school that I hated to leave, but had, had been requested to go to, on to another job. But uh, to come back and see the kids that are now growing up, and as you just heard from the young fellow, he's getting married, and uh, to hear about others who have families already and wonderful jobs, not only in Ontario, but throughout Canada and into the States, and so on, it's uh, very exciting. The decade rooms took the alumni back in time. But as former students strolled down memory lane, the future spirit of the Warriors was on their minds. I graduated in 73, and I would have to say that the high school years, I have college experience behind me too, but uh, high school, I think, was probably the best years of my life. Uh, fortunately, I was in a good mix of kids, and that's so important if you get into a good group of kids. Uh, I, as a parent now, I realize how important that is, that your children stay with a group of kids. Today, I think it's a day of celebration, and uh, I think that all those who are now involved in this school know that they must carry on the great tradition that this school has established over 75 years. As B. Meyer once said, the moments may have been temporary, but the memories will last forever. After celebrating 75 years, Port Credit has closed yet another chapter in its history, but that only means the best is yet to come. Here's to another 75 years.
One of the highlights of many high school student years is their time spent locked in physical combat with crosstown rivals or simply trying to beat their personal best. That's right, high school sports, and with Port Credit's rich athletic history, it wasn't hard to get former jocks to come out to show they still supported the blue and gold. It has been said that nothing brings a school closer together than athletics. And if that's true, then Port Credit traditionally should be one of the closest schools around. With names like Volpe and Martin running the show for football, it was hard not to get excited. And when your school has other such Mississauga Sports Council Hall of Famers as John Brenneman, Marjorie Homer Dixon, and Mac Hickox, that's definitely something to be proud of. For one magical evening, the Credit Valley Golf Club was transformed into the world's largest locker room, where former students and coaches relived their glory days by sharing fun memories of Port Credit. Well, when I came out in 1965, Port Credit really was a little town. And, you know, we think now of Mississauga, the city of Mississauga. Back then, it was a completely different place. It was like a little rural town, had its own little identity. The school had an identity. There was a very strong feeling towards the school. The school was a, the center of the community socially and athletically. And that sort of gave it, a, you know, a special flavor. And it really sort of hasn't lost that. And uh, over the years, you know, we got a little bit bigger and the, the, the makeup of the school changed a little bit, but it was always able, was able to sort of maintain that small town identity. And, you know, when you come to a reunion like we're having here tonight, you still see that. The old timers from the 20s and the 30s coming back, they remember the old school, and that's what I remember about Port Credit. I'll tell you, it brings back a lot of great memories. Uh, I, I think uh, probably the happiest times uh, as an individual is, is when you were a student uh, and I think the second happiest time is uh, when you coach. Uh, teaching uh, was, it, that was more of a job. Coaching was fun. And it was kind of the icing on the cake. I was in the guidance department and, uh, and I know that the kids always wanted to come and talk to you because when you, when you talk to kids outside of the classroom, they kind of let their hair down. And you really get to know uh, what's really on their mind. And I think that was very enjoyable. Well, I was very involved in, in sport and athletics, and, uh, but I had friends in all uh, aspects, certainly not just uh, sports, but I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go into phys ed or art. And I had an art teacher, Mr. Pollard, that I just thought the world of, and I thought, no, I'm going to go into art school. So I approached him with this, and he very tactfully, directly, I should say, said, Marjorie, your talent is limited. So I went into physics. I look back on the um, the years that I attended the school in the 60s. It, it's just a, uh, a lot of fond memories. It was more the process. It's just uh, being part of a, a group of uh, students that were real close buddies and uh, walking in the morning if it wasn't an early basketball practice or taking part in a championship game in football, uh, maybe working with a couple of the staff, uh, in um, say pole vault and track and field in the, in the spring. Uh, but as a student, we came in following a great tradition that Port Credit had established in the 50s and uh, a, a superb group of athletes and, and a fine athletic program with uh, Nick Volpe at the time and then uh, Aaron Ford and Bruce Cropper. There was a lot of good uh, coaches that were on and uh, you wanted to be out there. If you're any kind of uh, an athlete at all, you just wanted to be part of it and uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, I think there were there were two at uh, Port Credit, and uh, and that was being part of a a school that went to the Canadian finals, and our senior team uh, winning the um, All Canada Championship finals for the schools. And uh, I think the only other one I can remember scoring uh, 22 points in one of my basketball games, and that was the highlight of my career at uh, Port Credit. But uh, a lot of rich, rich memories there. Former Argonaut player Nick Volpe coached Port Credit to their first ever football title and still remembers the thrill of victory. Well, uh, I had played uh, with the Argos for a number of years and, and uh, in 1950 we won a great cup and uh, that was pretty exciting. But to be quite honest with you, I think I was just as excited uh, when we won the high school championship because uh, you know, you feel as a coach that uh, you have an awful lot to do with, uh, you know, blending the kids together, and it, it, it was fun. Volpe recalls the fire that swept over the school a little differently than some of the other alumni. 
Uh, we were uh, going to play in the Red Feather Tournament, and they had selected, uh, I think, eight teams from all over Ontario. And uh, we were to play on the Friday, and uh, I believe it was Thursday that the school caught fire, and uh, we were all at the school six o'clock in the morning, and everyone, the first thing everyone worried about was, are we gonna have any uniforms to play in the game tomorrow? So uh, we actually uh, got the firemen to go in the uh, back way and, and pull out our uh, equipment for us. And uh, so everything was okay and everybody was happy after that. How did you do with that tournament? Uh, we won 35 nothing. We beat North Bay, I can still remember that. Another former Argonaut head coach in Port Credit's history is Peter Martin, who had some huge shoes to fill when he took over from Volpe, who had won eight championships. Martin says that as a coach, nothing is more important than a team effort, something the Port Credit students had no problem giving him. You know, the individual greatness sort of really wasn't the thing. It was what we could do as a group. And, you know, football, I guess it started with Nick Volpe. They had terrific football teams. And when I arrived there and took over as senior football coach, the pressure was there to have good teams because Nick had won so many times. And we were able to win in 74. And I guess if I had one team I remember, it was the 74 team when we won the Peel Championship. And you always remember championships. But... The one thing I, I really take great pride in and it, it, with my years at Port Credit and dealing with the athletes and the students was the fact that they really tried to do the best they could, you know, and, and that was really made me feel good as a coach. You take a group of guys that really wanted to play, you know, some were good, some weren't so good, but they all wanted to play. They always gave you 150%, and that's all you could ask as a coach. And when the season was over, you could always feel very proud about what you're able to do. With a history of winning behind them, the former students say the first time they donned the blue and gold garb is a moment they will never forget. I was scared to death initially, um, and then just elation. I'm so proud. Oh, so very proud. I mean, blue, blue and gold was in my wardrobe from goodness knows what to what. Very proud. Going to the public school uh, schools around Port Credit, um, there was always this uh, a stare about finally getting to high school, and um, I believe Port Credit in those days, and I'm sure they do now, uh, uh, it was a feeling like probably the Montreal Canadiens, when you put on a Port Credit sweater, you were very proud of it, and because um, uh, some of the people that wore them before us had great tradition, and uh, it, was, uh, it, it gave you goosebumps. The tradition that had been established, uh, a student, uh, like a student in public school, uh, I went to Mineola, we would go down to watch the football games, and uh, they had great, great athletes, and uh, so you followed in that tradition. I mean, I was really into uh, sports, and uh, for me, it was uh, everything that I wanted, and, and more, it was great. Even students that were not athletes say that sports played a large role in their day-to-day -day school lives. Well, uh, there again, uh, I think there was more enthusiasm then than now. You knew everybody on the team. Uh, there were very few teams in the area. So I think it was a better time. Pictures of different decades were on display in one room where alumni could sign their name to their respective year. And in another room, the organizers set out sports memorabilia so the ex jocks could once again keep their eyes on the prize. Many of the people who attended this event say they were grateful for the opportunity to share the good times with old friends again. I'll tell you, it's, um, it's just fantastic. I wouldn't meet it for anything. I had seven friends that flew in tonight from all parts of the country because poor credit reunion and <clears throat> the tradition we had there is so important to everybody and it's in the minds of everybody and it's just uh, something that uh, none of us would miss. It, it means so much to us. Oh, I love it. I love it. I met a friend of mine who um, I knew in high school. I recognized him right away. Right away. We haven't changed at all, you know. And uh, I asked him a question and I don't know why I believed him because he was doing you know, fibbing with me all the time while we were growing up uh, in high school. He did the same thing to me tonight, and I fell. Hook, line, sinker, sinker, again. So, but it's just wonderful. I'm just so excited. After the roar of the crowd and the shot of the final gun goes off, it's good to see that the true meaning of athletics shines through, bringing people together.
The students may have forgotten their three R's, but they still remember the tunes and dance crazes of the times they lived in. After the school week was over, many a student could be found doing anything from the jitterbug to the hustle. And the reunion's pub night allowed alumni the chance to visit old musical memories performed by the people who lived them. As Oscar Wilde once said, we can have in life but one great experience at best, and the secret of life is to reproduce that experience as often as possible. It's no secret for Port Credit alumni, though, as they reunited at the Alumni Assembly and Pub Night. Bands from across the world and from all eight decades came back to relive the magic. But this night was about one thing, and one thing only. Just let me hear some other rock and roll. Milne, the pianist and guitarist for the Chords, a student band from the mid-1950s, hadn't seen the boys for 25 years. He flew in from Nova Scotia two weeks before the reunion to tune up his strings. some wet eyes here tonight. It's just the most wonderful thing. It's a once in a lifetime thing and it's the best thing that's ever happened to us. We've played a lot of places, but this is by far the most important thing for us. For Milne, this was a dream come true. Peter Toller really went to bat for us on this and uh, did a super job. Uh, we just didn't think it was really worth gathering and we knew the work that was involved to play maybe one or two songs in the assembly but uh, we said to Peter from the outset if, if you uh, give us a chance at the pub night we know the work that's involved and uh, we'll give them a good time a memorable time so uh, here we are you know dreams do come true pretty emotional whether it was the student band or the school choir music played an important part in the lives of many former students yeah, I really like the teachers that were here. Now, the teachers here were splendid. And whatever you did, they were, they were, uh, they were a great help to uh, uh, make it as successful as possible. And the music teacher of the day that was here, and I believe her name was Miss Hogue at the time, and um, she was going through for a, uh, a cathedral organist. And of course, um, she taught me a lot of music here while I was in the school and I enjoyed that very much. I enjoyed music really above everything. We were very fortunate in those times because uh, every student in Port Carter High School, we had a tradition to uphold. Uh, we had, like all the students ahead of us, we really respected them. And uh, it's just uh, a time in our life that uh, it's, it's kind of hard to find the words to explain. We had the teacher, the teaching staff was fantastic. They were genuinely interested in all of us. And the music was popping out of the radio. There were new hits coming out every day, and we were learning them. And uh, I, I kind of, at times, I feel sorry for the kids today because we had so much. And uh, that's what we're here tonight for, reliving those times. And uh, it's just wonderful. Oh, that was a joy. Uh, it, it just was a joy. I can't, it's hard to describe it in words. It was a, a joyous experience. And uh, the people, uh, the kids in those days, uh, I did the same thing in 47 in the auditorium at assemblies and uh, they asked me to play the piano and uh, we got a lot, I think we had the happiness level uh, approaching out of 10, I think we were getting pretty close to 10 in those days and I think today we got pretty close to 10 there too, the way they responded to it, so it was a joy to be back and doing some of that stuff. While at Port Credit, Rice Honeywell wrote the music to the school song, the same song that continues to be used today. that was a skit. They had a contest and they already had the words. Uh, a nice young lady by the name of Marge Crimp uh, wrote the words and won the, the prize for the words and then they said can we put this to music and they offered a prize for the person that could write the music for it. So I wrote the music and happily won the contest and uh, I didn't get rich doing that but I uh, but the 10 bucks I wanted gave it handy at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of fun. It was fun writing a song for the school. It's just really overwhelming and uh, very nostalgic. 
wonderful. Maybe we'll write a book when this is all a part of it. But one thing they do know is the memories they once shared will never be forgotten. Instead, they will continue to be relived for many years to come. The reunion came to an end all too soon for many of the former classmates, especially those who traveled from all across Canada to attend. But there was one more event left, the gala at the Trillium Banquet Hall. And as reporter Jane Shannon found, what a night it was, as over 700 of Port Credit's alumni filled the hall for a sad farewell, but a heck of a great time. As guests started to arrive, I decided to greet them and ask a few of them what it was like seeing their old high school chums after so many years. Well, it's kind of nice because they recognize me, but I don't always recognize them if they're ladies. Ladies change more men. <laughs> no, I don't think, I think you're wrong. No, <laughs> I don't know. We agree to differ. Women get better. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know they do. Yeah. Yeah. Men, men don't get better with age, is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, men don't get, no, we get poorer. Yeah. <laughs> and for some, the mere mention of those old high school football games sparked the memories of glory days gone by. In those days, nobody ever missed a football game like they do now. And why is that? I don't know. It was a big thing in those days. We had more school spirit, I think. Really? That's true. Yeah. yeah. We did. We, our school spirit was terrific, and we never missed a game. And the games were terrific. The players were terrific. It was, it was everything. Okay, now, ladies, you can be honest. Was it anything to do with those football players? Sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> of course. Yeah, they were great. Good looking, too. And, of course, there were those who found that things at the school weren't quite as intimidating as they once were. Being that long ago, it's hard to sort of um, think about what the school was like when you were there. And, as I said, some of the people mentioned that the, the auditorium looks a lot smaller than when, you, when you're there. And, of course, you, you know, in the auditorium, you're sort of awed by the strictness of whatever the principal wants to do that day. And... Once everyone had arrived and, of course, caught up with old friends and the latest gossip, it was time for dinner. But before dinner, everyone stood for an emotional rendition of the Port Credit Secondary School song led by alumnus Siobhan Duffy. everyone had settled for dinner and continued to look for their old friends, I decided it was time I caught up on a little high school gossip and perhaps even stir up a little trouble. My name's Terry and I brought my sister here tonight and we graduated in 1969. And I understand she has a little bit of a secret here that she doesn't want anyone to know about. That is correct. She's searching for her old boyfriend. And some of the people here seem to think that they've seen him somewhere over in the purple section. So tonight we're searching for the mystery man. Well, why are we searching for him? I think they're still in love. Why did they break up? Do you know? Why Ma, we've, we've got to get the low down why here. Did, why did you break up, mystery woman? Because I wanted to travel, and he wanted to stay in Ontario and become rich and retire early. Is he rich? Now can I pick up my phone? He's rich enough. Are you still in love with him? I will always love him. I will always love him as a friend. Are you going to tell us what his name is? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Steve Atkinson. And so, with the help of Terry, I decided to find Steve and ask him if he still had a thing for Karen. Do you see him yet? Not yet. Oh, I see him. I see him. There he is. Where is he? See the young lady with the glasses on right there? And uh -huh. th there he is. He's looking at us right now. There he's Hi. got his hands up. That's the guy you want to talk to. Okay, let's, let's go. Okay, you, okay. Do you want to go let's around go this, this way. way? Yeah, we'll go this way. So, good evening. Good evening to you. Now, do you have any idea why we seek, we've seek? we come to find you? Why did you tell me fine? Well, probably you're sent by the creditors now. No, if, no. If, if, well, if it's, it's a better, firm, it's better. I'm sorry. I want to get sex. down to the point here, guys. Okay. Yeah. Karen's sitting Six. over there. Where? Karen. Yeah. Karen. Yes. Karen. Oh, your last name is sister. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, obviously. Well, what we want to know is, do you remember who she is now? Is this all coming? We're getting work. We're getting, people are throwing food at us here. Okay. <laughs> now, what we want to know is, do you remember who she is? Is it all coming back? I have back a vague now? recollection, yes. She have what? dark hair? Oh my gosh. Close. Oh my god, Close. this is embarrassing. Close. Once Steve finally remembered who Karen was, he assured us that he was going to ask her to dance. And they did dance, but because he was married, they shook hands and went their separate ways. And so my quest for a true love story continued, and I actually found one this time with a happy 14th. ending. I'm studying Valentine's for Day. Happened to be studying for exams, uh -huh. and it should have been should have been playing that hockey that night. Is that yeah, right? That's Anne? right. That's right. So here and we are Linda. out in the parking lot of Port Credit High, and yours truly has the hood down, 64 Biscay, uh -huh. bottle of wine, Woo! and a bucket with ice, chocolates. The hood down. This is February 14th. This is very cold in this country. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I said to my aunt, I said, Ann. We're going to be together forever, and oh, here we are tonight. Oh, right? Right? Here we are. Oh, this is... But love stories weren't the only stories I heard. Basically how it goes is that back in high school, I weighed all of, what, 160 pounds soaking wet. Now uh -huh. I'm up to 240, and these guys are still busting on me, and I'm a real tall guy now. <laughs> all right? That's what it is. That's it? That's the story. That's but these guys, they're leaning on me, right? Oh, so if you want to see a real good, if you want to see a real good fight later, watch this table, all right? <laughs> once dinner finished, it was time to dance, and once again, Siobhan Duffy took to the stage. <laughs> Not everyone was in the mood for dancing. We're talking business. <laughs> business at a reunion? Don't be well. Do you want us to tell you? Well, do you want to tell us? Sure. What are you talking about? I'm giving her my business card. The evening did eventually come to an end, and therefore so did Port Credit Secondary School 75th reunion. And although it was a sad parting, reunion left everyone with fond memories they'll treasure forever. Great thing that we reunion. Mom for it. It's yeah. great to see a lot of people that uh, you always wonder how they're doing, and now you get to find out. Yeah, you know, it's one thing to perform in front of large crowds, which I've done a lot of, because this is what I've done for the last uh, 10 or 12 years, but it's another thing to perform in front of everybody you know. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I know you've had a wonderful time, and see you at the next reunion. So I guess he was a little bit uh, intimidating. Yeah, he was. He was uh, there a long while. Good principal. Yeah, very tough, though. Manly. Did you, have, you enjoyed your time at Port Credit? Oh, yeah, I come from around here. Yep, yeah. had a nice time. Party table. Party table. Party table. Party okay, table. Got that? Party Party table. table. My Nig name is Nigel, Nigel Phipps, Phipps, class of 1980. Old times and new.
historic and Mississauga's oldest high school. To the students and faculty who will continue to fill its halls in the next 75 years, keep up the tradition. I'm Tina May. Thank you for watching. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line at 905-897-3994 or email us your comments. Hi, I'm Roger Wardell, and here's what we're working on for tonight's 6 o'clock edition of First Local. They meet on a regular basis, they're strategic, and they make sure that what they're doing is investing in the community for the long term. A Dare to Dream fundraiser for Zonta. What Zonta really does is professional women who work to advance the status of women in, the, in their communities and globally. We think it's a great community event. It brings out a lot of people. We have over 12,000 participants. And we meet up with a very close-knit group of runners preparing for the Mississauga Marathon. That's tonight on First Local at 6 and 10 o'clock. Your first choice for local news, entertainment, and sports. In my game, we play with a bigger ball. It's called a softball. But it's not soft at all. In my game, in my game, the pitcher throws under him. Under him. Under him. In my game, in my game, we play seven innings. Seven innings of fast, fantastic fun. Softball. My game. My game. My game. My game. My game. My game. Over a quarter million Canadians call softball their game. Make it yours. She was very high profile, the main opposition to Ron Searle. How do you evacuate 300,000 people and do it without even an injury, without an incident, without a problem? This proved very quickly her capabilities, uh, her stamina. If there's any one thing that made Hazel McCallion a household name, it was the way she handled that train derailment. Hazel, the early years as mayor. The miniseries continues on Rogers TV.